hope I never, I hope I'm never accused of making quote unquote adult movies. Steven Spielberg. The big trick will be how many, you know, personal pictures can get made within the system in Hollywood. Martin Scorsese. Most people are shocked when they realize that movies disappear. George Lucas. Three great directors raise questions and hopes for the future of film. Three legendary directors join Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert to look at the future of the movies. That's right, it's not a real balcony, it's only a set. And on this special program, Gene and I have gone behind the scenes to talk about the future of the movies. We visited three of America's best and most innovative directors to ask them to look into their crystal balls to predict what the future holds for themselves, for their movies, and for movie going in general. We also asked about the future of old movies. How will they be preserved and seen in the future? I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. I began our look into the future by talking with the most successful director of our time, of all time, Steven Spielberg, Jaws, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, E.T., Raiders of the Lost Ark, towering entertainments, everyone. Spielberg, 42 years old, has been described as the poet of suburbia, and he works in a suburban palace. His Amblin Entertainment office building on the Universal Pictures lot in Southern California is a massive southwestern-style home, complete with a game room, country kitchen, and state-of-the-art screening room. I traveled out to the Skywalker Ranch, north of San Francisco, where 46-year-old George Lucas has developed one of the world's most advanced centers for film and video research and development. Paid for by the profits from the Star Wars Bonanza, this state-of-the-art facility in the coincidentally named Lucas Valley is where special effects technicians, computer programmers, and audio and video inventors are finding ways to make a movie out of almost anything that George Lucas or anybody else can dream up. Not many people who saw the movie The Abyss, for example, had any idea that this creature, which seemed to be made entirely of water, was actually made entirely out of a computer program and laser technology made by wizards working for Lucas at his industrial light and magic company. Finally, we both went to talk to Martin Scorsese, widely acknowledged by critics and his fellow directors as the greatest film artist of his generation. Scorsese, 47, is the director of Raging Bull, Taxi Driver, Mean Streets, and he is most comfortable on the Mean Streets of New York City. Alone of these three directors, he has appeared in his own film. His biggest role, a disturbed passenger in the backseat of Robert De Niro's cab, in taxi driver. Did I, tell you to put, did, I do, did I tell you to do that with the meter? Put the meter back. Let the numbers go on. I don't care what I have to pay. I didn't, I'm not getting out. We talked to Scorsese in the Times Square office building where he works. We first wanted to know from each of these directors what their immediate future would be like in the 1990s. You're going to get this question until you drop. Uh, the E.T. sequel. Mm -hmm. In the 90s? No. Go further. 2010? No. <laughs> 2020? No. <laughs> no. And just so people understand, when you say no, you're saying no to probably hundreds of millions of dollars. You yes. know that. Yeah. It ended. It was a wonderful love affair. And then it was over. And then Elliot went back to his life, and E.T. went back to his planet. There's, there's no going back. There's nothing more to say. I said it all. If I, but with Raiders, I had an appetite, as George did more adventure and I still have an appetite to make adventure movies not the Raiders type of films but I still want to do adventure films in my career what have you seen that you said this could be let's just be speculative this could be a this could be a feature film are there something that I've been noodling around this is uh, possible well I'm, I'm, I mean it's, it's, it's no secret that I'm, I'm interested in a biography on Howard Hughes he was really a, a, just a complete contradiction uh, he was a movie producer you know, he was a megalomaniac. He, he had his, he was interested in airplanes. You know, I have a love affair with airplanes ad nauseum. 
as 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 did Hughes, and 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 uh, there are many different, and also that he became completely reclusive, and uh, existed in kind of an inner world, and he was at one point in his life for several decades the most gregarious person, and then the following several decades the most uh, infamously reclusive person, Natalie, uh, that's ever been talked about in American history, and or 20th century history, and I just find that very fascinating. It's been about seven years since the last uh, Star Wars movie. Yeah. 83, was it? 83, yeah. I understand that you're finally <laughs> going to go back into that universe. Yeah, I've been... Um, obviously, I have these, these stories, and... Um, I've been trying to figure out a time when I'm going to devote, you know, a serious amount of time to, to bringing these next three stories to the screen. When you started on the Star Wars saga, you had nine stories all together in your mind. No, when I, what really happened was, is I wrote a screenplay. Mm -hmm. The screenplay was way too big, you know. And so what I decided to do was take the first act of that screenplay and make it into a movie. And so I, that's what I did with Star Wars. But Star Wars, Empire, and Jedi are really four, five, and six. Yeah. And you're now thinking of doing one, two, one, two and three. Yeah. Because I have all the information on that, and it's sort of the stories. I know the stories. And do they take place in the lifespan of the earlier in the lifespan of the characters in four, five, and six? Or yeah. It's really about uh, uh, you know um, Obi Wan Kenobi as a boy, and uh, can't imagine him as a boy. Yeah. Well, he was a boy, and so was uh, <laughs> you know so was. Uh, uh, Anakin Skywalker, mm -hmm. and uh, who became Darth Vader eventually, and um, you know it's those characters and how they ended up getting where they were. In terms of genres, in your future, what haven't you done that is on your checklist? Romance. <laughs> <laughs> well, an unhappy romance, but it's a romance. <laughs> so, unrequited love. You, there's unrequited love throughout all your pictures. There's unrequited well, love. They still have costumes. <laughs> 1870s. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? Yeah. Uh, it's a nice project. I hope I hope to do it um, in a couple of years. Actually, the first film by any one of these three directors in the 90s will be Scorsese's Goodfellas, a look at three generations in the mafia. You're getting a rare glimpse at a work print of this movie, which will come out later this year. And in this scene, Scorsese's mother, Catherine, plays the mother of mobster Joe Pesci, who has brought friends Robert De Niro and Ray Liotta to his house following a murder. Tonight we were out late, we took a ride on the, out to the country and we hit one of those deers. I tell you, that's where the blood came from. I told you, Jimmy told you before, I won't change. Anyway, you know, it reminds me, I need this knife. I'm gonna take this, it's okay? Okay, yeah, just need it for bring it while. back though, you know. Critical success has rarely been a problem for Martin Scorsese, but commercial success has been a problem. I really hope one day, maybe in this decade, to have one of my pictures make a lot of money. That'd be great. You know, that would be a different genre. That would be a different genre. A picture that makes a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> some, they make some money. They make some, but not not not. So the, these figures are amazing, aren't they? Pictures come out, and money makes really 160 million. They get upset. If you were, <laughs> if you were looking at the way movies are going, though, in terms of the the so-called home run picture, the 200 million dollar picture. Yeah, these things are amazing. The 300 million dollar yeah. picture. Do you think that's bad? Is that going to be bad in the next 10 years? That so many studios seem to be swinging for the fences. It, I think it could be. I think it could be. Uh, it's difficult. And that's why I think, in a way, I would need some names to help, to help get certain, certain, certain kinds of stories I want made. <coughs> because the stories are no way, uh, in the studio's eyes, uh, no way going to uh, go for that, aim for that, that, uh, that uh, level of $200 million uh, receipts. For George Lucas, the problem isn't how much his movies might make, but how much they might cost. The cost of doing these kind of mo movies has just gone completely through the roof. I mean, uh, if I were to try to do uh, a Return of the Jedi today using the same technology and the same techniques uh, that I used, you know, seven years ago, but to do that movie today would cost, I would say, at least $75 million. You're kidding. Yeah. Even, but, but yet, in seven years, there's been so much advance in the in the computer technology and in the other. Well, the, when you made that, Star Wars, the first picture, the the personal computer didn't exist. But the thing of it is that the right yeah the um, that computer technology isn't really to a point now where it's cost effective. And I would say within five years, uh, the computer technology will be cheaper than the old-fashioned one. It's amusing because people are so uh, willing to casually say, "Oh, it's all done on computers." Whatever you're talking about, people say, "Oh, it's all done on computers these days." 
And it isn't all done on computers yet. Yeah. I've, believe me, I've been involved in a lot of state-of-the-art computer technology, and then you'd be surprised what they can't do. <laughs> we got a ways to go. They will be able to do it, but so they can't do it right now. A long time ago, you once told me, speaking of George Lucas, you said, someday we'll all be working for George. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's more likely, I think, that someday everyone will be working for you. Well, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> I mean, this is, as a producer, no, not really, because I'm not really interested. If, if that were true, I'd be running a studio by now. You've had the offers. I've had, oh, uh, yeah, yeah, many times to, to really, you know, run, run a movie studio and make 18 to 25 films a year, and I just, I just don't want to do that. Because? Because how do you be attentive to 18 to 25 movies a year? It's a business, and sometimes you have to make movies you don't want to make to fill the bill, and that's a terrible way to, you know, to get through your creative life anyway. Now, you're 42 years old. Are you going to grow up in the 90s? I don't know. I mean, I mean, uh, I don't, I'm not, not going to say I hope so. I mean, I'm not looking to grow up in the 90s. I'm not making a conscious effort to grow up in the 90s. I'm, I think I'm changing all the time, but I also think that, that I'm not going to know really who I am through my movies until I've made a lot more films and can look back and say either I grew up or I never grew up. That's not my problem. Then what is? I don't have any problems in that way, in that regard. My problem is finding good stories from my own imagination. It's not, you know, it's never been easy. You know, it's, it's talk of producers on Broadway, you know, in the old days, you know. We've got to have a show. We've got to have a show. You know, pacing. You know, smoke coming out of their feet as they pace hours in a hotel room trying to think of a show. It's the age-old problem, you know. You know, what do we do to entertain you next? What do we do to entertain ourselves next? 